It is a great honor to be asked to speak to you this afternoon. And um, <clears throat> the honor takes on a special poignance with the Seifter family here. <clears throat> so thank you so much for this great privilege. Also, thanks to Dr. Briel for picking me up on the west side of Manhattan on this rainy afternoon and driving me through New York City traffic to get me here on time, which he did. When I looked out and saw the rain today, I was wondering if anyone would show up. You have, thank God. <laughs> so we'll get on with it. Uh, ordinarily, I would start with a few jokes or funny anecdotes. But as I travel the country covering stories for the New York Times, I don't find much that is funny going on. So no jokes this afternoon. I'm hard at work on a book called Wounded Colossus. And it's about some of the great challenges facing the United States today, challenges that have resulted largely from wounds that were self-inflicted over the past 30 years or so. Those wounds are becoming ever more serious almost by the day, and they require action from our elected leaders, from the press, which is supposed to keep us properly informed, and from each and every one of us as good citizens who care about our country and the future of our families. Later in this talk, I will outline a three-pronged formula for revitalizing this great wounded colossus called America, a regimen designed to bring our country back to robust health. To put things in perspective, I want to go back a few years, a lot of years actually, all the way back to the 1950s and 60s when I was a young boy growing up in Montclair, New Jersey. It's weird, Montclair is a fashionable town now, so the town that you rode your bicycle around and went to the library and went to school in is now like hot and you know these Hotshot editors from the Times are like buying property in Montclair. Hey, that's my town. Yeah. <laughs> my wife and I went to dinner in Montclair. This is about four or five years ago. And we go to this restaurant, and it's, you know, it could be a restaurant from Soho in Manhattan. I'm going, you know, what happened to my town? But anyway, it was a great place, it was a great place to grow up. In that post-war World War II period, when I was growing up, the economy was booming in this country. Unemployment was low, wages and profits were high, and the nation's, the nation's wealth was distributed in a way that was remarkably equitable by today's standards. The middle class was growing, and it was not yet a mortal sin for a politician to mention the poor. A first-rate college education was eminently affordable. But for all of its problems, and there were still many, Vietnam would prove to be a disaster. Racism, sexism, and homophobia were rampant. But for all of its problems, the U.S. seemed to be moving in the right direction. Not even the murderous violence that greeted the Civil Rights Movement could stem the optimism of that period. James Farmer, who was one of the great leaders of that movement, once told me they could kill us, but they couldn't stop us. I know this stuff because I lived it. I think of myself as the poster child for the American dream. When I was a young man, I could make a cold call to the Star Ledger in Newark, New Jersey, have the managing editor answer the phone himself, get hired almost immediately as a reporter. When I moved to New York, I could look through the classified ads in the New York Times. Obviously, this was a long time before the internet and Craigslist. I could look in these classified ads, hop on a subway train, and rent an affordable apartment on the Upper West Side of Manhattan right across from one of the main entrances to Central Park. Not only was college affordable in those days, but for many there was a substantial check that came in the mail periodically from the GI Bill. <clears throat> there, was an, there was a sense and understanding that education was important, not just to the students themselves, but to the future of the country. It was not cool in those days to be a nitwit. Idiots tried to keep their ignorance to themselves. <laughs> now they can parade it on reality TV shows, <laughs> or Facebook, or Twitter, or on Fox News. <laughs> the playwright Arthur Miller and the poet Archibald McLeish 
like to say that the essence of America was its promises. I know about that too. My father was an upholsterer and my mother was a seamstress, but they dreamed that their son in the back of their shop, the skinny kid with the big thick eyeglasses, could make something up and thank God for contact lenses. <laughs> They dreamed that he could make something of himself if he used his head and worked hard. My father, a very smart man, could not have had any of the jobs that I've held in my career. He couldn't have been a reporter for the Star Ledger or city editor of the New York Daily News or a national correspondent for NBC News or an op-ed columnist for the New York Times. But he and my mom could not only dream but also believe, like so many other parents from one coast to the other, that this country was the place where that kind of quantum leap could be made in just one generation. My view of the United States in those days is of a rich and flourishing landscape. It still required a lot of work, but it was filled with immense promise. We were not good stewards of that landscape. I gave the commencement address at Pomona College in May and I told the graduates that whenever I looked around at the state of affairs that my generation was handing off to them, I had to cringe. Two wars, an economy in shambles, global warming, the newspaper industry, our primary source of information about the world in danger of going up in smoke. The automobile industry, which powered the economy for so many decades, gasping so desperately for breath it had to rely on taxpayer bailouts and such visionary initiatives as the Cash for Clunkers program. Over the past three or four decades, we've allowed the United States to morph into a country that hollowed out its manufacturing base and sent the jobs overseas, that refused to maintain and rebuild its own infrastructure, that would not establish a first-rate public school system for all of its children, that spent more money per capita than any other country on the planet for health care, but still could not cover some 40 to 50 million of its people. It became a country that fought wars but had no idea how to win them or pay for them. A country that let a great city like New Orleans drown rather than protect it with an adequate system of levees. It's a country in which a bridge on an interstate highway in Minneapolis collapsed at rush hour hurling cars, vans, and trucks into the Mississippi River 80 feet below. What in the world happened? This does not sound like the same proud nation that triumphed in World War II, that helped revive Western Europe with the Marshall Plan, that built the interstate highway system, and created a behemoth of an economy that lifted the fortunes of most of its citizens and dazzled the rest of the world. How did we get from there to here? Well, I can't give you all the reasons, but one of the biggest was that we lost a great deal of contact with reality, and that's always dangerous. We became a society that was chronically unable or unwilling to face up to the truth when tough situations arose and difficult choices had to be made. We still suffer from that very destructive affliction. Here's an example. Whatever you think of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, we tried and continue to try to fight them without raising the taxes needed to pay for them or assembling the immense number of troops needed to fight them effectively. We put the cost of those wars on a credit card, driving up our long-term budget deficits. And since we don't have a draft and not nearly enough young people will volunteer to go off and fight those wars, We've had to resort to the unconscionable practice of sending the same troops into the combat zones again and again for as many as three, four, or more tours. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was in San Francisco talking with Dr. Charles Marmar, who is one of the foremost experts on post-traumatic stress disorder and depression. And he's been working with a team that is studying the mental health challenges faced by veterans of the Iraq in Afghanistan wars. Hundreds of thousands of these, hundreds of thousands of these young fighting men and women are being derailed by mental illness and other serious stress-related disorders. Suicides are a big problem, as are alcoholism and drug abuse and domestic violence and the crack up of families from all of the above. And I haven't even touched on the physical wounds of combat. Just take a walk 
around the Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, it is really disturbing. It's chilling. You'll see men and women with just one leg, or no legs, or no arms, sometimes with three limbs lost, or horrible burns, or paralyzed. We've remained in flat-out denial about the consequences to our society of these wars. The Nobel Prize winning economist Joseph Stiglitz and his colleague, a Harvard economist named Linda Bilmes, have calculated that the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan will cost us a mind-boggling $3 trillion at least when all is said and done. If, as a nation, we're going to engage in warfare, why should the volunteers for military service, a very small percentage of the U.S. population, be the ones shouldering the entire load? the only ones contributing to the effort. Why are most of the rest of us immune to any of the sacrifices we're asking them to make? How is that in any way equitable or just? If we had a draft in this country, or even just the threat of a draft, we'd be out of Iraq and Afghanistan in a heartbeat. Very few privileged families would be willing to send their sons and daughters off to combat in those countries. We have not faced up to the reality of these wars, the toll they are taking on our young fighting men and women and their families, the costs, financial and otherwise, to our society as a whole, and the general unwillingness of most Americans to share any of the burdens, any of the sacrifices. There are many other consequences of this inability or unwillingness of ours to face up to reality. We've stopped looking at the long-term needs of our society, and we long ago took our eyes off the interests of ordinary working men and women. That thriving post-war period during which the standard of living of the vast majority of Americans improved significantly lasted about 30 years. That's when I was growing up. One of the keys to that extended boom was that jobs were plentiful. For the most part, even the poor and the poorly educated could find work. The very foundation of our remarkable economic success was the widespread availability of jobs. It wasn't about the stock market soaring. It wasn't about housing bubbles. It wasn't about corporate monsters like Citigroup and Merrill Lynch and AIG engaged in some mysterious economic voodoo, like the craze for credit default swaps and other exotic derivatives that even their own executives didn't understand, let alone the average person. It wasn't about any of that stuff. It was about jobs. We've lost sight of the paramount importance of employment in a society like ours. We keep thinking that if we bail out the banks, stimulate the economy, nudge the GDP into positive territory, reform the health care system, we keep thinking that if we do any or all of those things, job creation will somehow automatically, almost magically follow. We used to know better. Go all the way back to Franklin Roosevelt and the Depression. Roosevelt's first inaugural address is famous for the stirring phrase, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. But he also said in that speech, our greatest primary task is to put people to work. And he said the country should treat that task as we would treat the emergency of a war. The key issue then was jobs, and Roosevelt knew it, and that's the key issue now. Nearly 10% of the American workforce is unemployed. That's more than 15 million people. A third of them have been without a job for more than six months. If you count the men and women who have become discouraged and have stopped looking for work, and those who are working part-time because they can't find full-time jobs, you're talking about 17 to 18% of all American workers. That is a disaster. The jobless rate in California is a knee-buckling 12.2 percent. That's the official rate in California. For blacks, it's over 15 percent. If you go into some neighborhoods, you will find jobless rates of 65, 70, 75, 80 percent. Nobody has a job. Just to get back to where we were when the recession began in December 2007, and that means back to what it was like after seven years of George W. Bush, we'd have to create nearly 10 million jobs. 10 million. No one expects that to happen anytime soon. 
which means we're not even going to get back anytime soon to the way things were under Bush. We're still losing jobs at a rate of more than a quarter of a million a month. Are we treating this, in FDR's words, as we would treat the emergency of a war, as they might have said when I was at the Daily News? Forget about it. We don't even treat our wars that way. We don't even act like the wars are an emergency. We're sleepwalking as a society. We're in denial. And if we don't snap out of it, trust me, things are only going to get worse. You have to have everybody working, or nearly everybody, in order to generate the purchasing power necessary to keep a consumer economy like ours aloft. At the time the recession hit, consumer spending made up about 70 percent of our overall economy. But consumers are in trouble, as everybody here understands. They've maxed out their credit cards. They've watched in horror as the equity in their homes disappeared. Their 401ks have been clobbered. The only money they can put their hands on is that all-important paycheck. So the only way to kickstart spending is to put people back to work. But as a society, we don't focus on the fundamental interests of working people the way we once did. We used to have a very powerful forces looking out for working men and women in the United States. Roosevelt was a stalwart, as was the Democratic Party in general, right through the 1960s. And of course, we had a very strong labor movement. This benefit not just working people, but the society as a whole, the government to some extent, along with labor unions and a wide variety of civic organizations, helped offset the enormous power of big business. So with that help, ordinary working men and women had some clout. Business didn't have all the clout. This enabled us to spread the benefits of economic growth across a wide swath of the population. As Robert Reich, who was Secretary of Labor in the Clinton administration, has written of this period, most people enjoyed more security and stability and a larger share of the nation's income than they ever had before or ever would again. As he put it, something approximating the common good was achieved. You don't hear much about the common good anymore. That ended in the 1970s, and we've been living in denial since then, floating on one bubble after another, catering more and more to the demands of the very wealthy, and convincing ourselves, amazingly, that looking out for the welfare of the rich was somehow the best way to take care of the interests of working people and the nation as a whole. How did they sell us that bill of goods? How did we buy into it? What did that do for us? It left us with the worst economic inequality since the 1920s and the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. In our foolishness, we all but wrecked the greatest economy the world has ever known. We looked out for the rich as if they were the only ones who mattered. We engaged in relentless deregulation. We worshiped at the altar of an unfettered free market, and we ended up in a perilously deep economic hole. My point is that this dire situation didn't come out of nowhere, and it didn't start with this recession. We had a good thing going, but we didn't take care of it. We didn't nurture it. That wonderful period that I've been talking about, when it seemed as though the U.S. had been touched by magic, fizzled out more than 30 years ago. But we didn't acknowledge that it had fizzled out. We pretended that things were still fine. Let's look at what has happened to ordinary Americans since the end of that great post-war boom that lasted roughly from 1945 to the mid-1970s. Men who are now in their 30s, and it's important to note that the figures I'm using now were compiled before this recession hit, so things are actually somewhat worse than what I'm about to describe. Men who are now in their 30s, the prime age for raising a family, earn less money than members of their father's generation did at the same age. If you adjust for inflation from 1980, when Ronald Reagan was elected president, to 2005, which is the last year for which I have complete statistics, the average income for the vast majority of Americans declined. For a quarter of a century, the average income for most Americans went down, and we managed not to notice. But during that same period, and this is according to the Congressional Budget Office, 
when the income of the vast majority of Americans was going down, the after-tax income of the top 1% rose a breathtaking 228%. The bottom 90% saw their incomes decline while the fortunes of the top 1% skyrocketed. That's what I mean by being in denial. We closed our eyes to the gross economic unfairness that played out over that long period like someone who closes his or her eyes to high blood pressure. We pretended, <coughs> excuse me, we pretended that it was not taking a toll on our families and on our society. We kept papering over the economic problems that ordinary working Americans were facing. And this was easy to do in some respects because the standard of living actually improved for a lot of people. But the standard of living improved not because personal incomes grew, but because women, wives and mothers, went into the workplace in droves. It may be hard to believe, but the peak income year for most Americans, the best year for 90% of the population, was way back in 1973. Barack Obama was 12 years old and Joe Namath was the quarterback of my beloved Jets. There shouldn't be any mystery as to why things have gone haywire. We did it to ourselves. Economically, we kept taking from working people and giving to the rich, and that was unsustainable. In December 2007, the very month that the economists tell us that this recession started, the top Wall Street securities firms handed out almost $40 billion in seasonal bonuses bonuses, the highest total ever. They were raising toasts on Wall Street while the American economy was sinking like the Titanic. I thought at the time that it was obscene. I wrote a column that ran three days before Christmas in 2007 that said, <clears throat> even as the Wall Streeters are high-fiving and ordering up record shipments of champagne and caviar, the American dream is on life support. Anyone with eyes should have been able to see that we were in deep trouble long before this recession hit. The dream was on life support because so many ordinary Americans just couldn't make it anymore. They'd exhausted their capacity to tread water. Wives and mothers were already working. The equity in their homes had been drained and families had taken on debt loads for cars, for college tuition, for medical treatment that would have buckled the knees of the strongest pack animals. An economic collapse of some sort was inevitable. Millions of American families were relying on credit cards to bridge the gaps created by lost jobs, stagnant wages, and higher costs of living. Credit cards were being used to pay bills that should have been covered by the weekly or monthly paycheck. You didn't have to be a genius to understand what was happening. I wrote in that column back in 2007, we're running out of smoke and mirrors. In an economy like ours, employment is the issue that overrides all others. For most Americans, the only way to make it, to provide for their families, to establish a measure of economic security, and to retire in a reasonable state of comfort is through gainful employment, a job. But we're going backwards. We're not creating jobs. We're losing them. And it's not just the loss of jobs. The Economic Policy Institute in Washington has pointed out that workers who are still employed are seeing a decline in their living standards because of a deterioration of real wages brought on by the recession. The number of people in poverty is increasing. Homelessness is increasing. School budgets are collapsing. Libraries are closing. The entire University of California education system is in dire financial strait. It used to be one of the finest public education systems in the world. Now it doesn't know where the next dollar is coming from. We know that cigarettes cause cancers in humans. Well, joblessness creates a kind of cancer in our society, and right now it's metastasizing. People who are out of work don't buy cars. They don't refurnish their homes. They don't take their families on vacation. They put off getting married and having children, and they frequently lose their zest for living. A study at Rutgers University found that two-thirds of the unemployed workers who responded to a national survey reported being depressed, and three-fourths said they experienced feelings of helplessness. 
More ominously, a majority of those surveyed said they did not believe this was a typical cyclical downturn. They felt that something more fundamental and lasting was underway, and they're right. One of the authors of the study, a professor named Carl Van Horn, said, and this is a quote, Americans believe that this is the Katrina of recessions. Folks are on their rooftops without a boat, the water is rising, and many see no way out. So what do we do about all this? We can remain in denial and pretend it's not happening. Or we can rise to the greatness that this moment in history demands. I remember Jack Kennedy in that amazing 1960 presidential campaign against Richard Nixon telling Americans at almost every stop that we can do better. I remember the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on that summer day in 1963 telling a rapt and largely segregated nation that even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. I remember the civil rights protests and the ferment on the college campuses. I don't see that same fire, that same sense of energy and urgency today. I look around and I see a country more or less passively accepting a chronic state of war and the demise of a broadly egalitarian society. I see the great and glorious United States of my youth and young adulthood fading before my eyes. Something is radically wrong when a report from the AFL-CIO comes across my desk that says a third of all American workers under the age of 35 are living at home with their parents for financial reasons. Something is wrong when my newspaper can write, as it did recently, that a year after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, a year in which the very viability of American-style capitalism was called into serious question, the surprise is not how much has changed in the financial industry, but how little. Something is wrong when we find out that right now, while we're still in the throes of this awful financial crisis, with so many Americans suffering so grievously, Wall Street is thriving again, handing out bonuses bigger than the ones I wrote about in December 2007, which was the first month of this great recession. When do we say enough already? Two-thirds of all the income gains from the years 2007, 2002 to 2007, two-thirds, went to the top 1% of Americans. It has to stop. We can't continue transferring the nation's wealth to those at the apex of the pyramid while hoping that someday, maybe, the benefits of that transfer will trickle down in the form of employment and improved living standards for the many millions of families that are struggling to make it from day to day. That money is never going to trickle down. It's a fairy tale, and we're crazy if we continue to believe it. American-style capitalism has, in fact, broken down. It is not working for the vast majority of our citizens or for the nation as a whole, which is why, collectively, we are all but submerged individually and as a nation in what appears to be a bottomless sinkhole of debt. American families are out of money, and so is the government. While Wall Street is living it up, the Census Bureau tells us that median family incomes fell by nearly $2,000 in 2008. The middle class is getting stomped. It's shrinking. And you don't even want to know what's happening to the poor. So what do we do? The first and most important thing is to acknowledge that we have a problem, an array of problems, really. Only then can we properly diagnose them and come up with a treatment regimen that will bring our country back to robust health. We can't do everything at once, so let's tackle the most serious matters first. As unemployment is crippling our country, we'll start there. We have to recognize this employment crisis for what it really is, a grave threat to the American standard of living for decades to come. Not only are families suffering, but tax revenues, the money we need to pay for essential public services at the federal, state, and local levels are plummeting. People who are out of work do not pay taxes. Since we are increasing government spending, even as tax revenues are declining, federal budget deficits are spiraling towards the moon, and state and local governments are in terrible fiscal shape. So we need to intervene now. We need to do all we can 
to not only bring these awful job losses to an end, but to use the power of the government in a variety of ways to spark the creation of as many new jobs as possible. Think about it. We're still losing more than 200,000 jobs a month. If we turn that around by the end of the year and create, say, 100,000 or 150,000 jobs in a month, the politicians and the business commentators will be celebrating like it's New Year's or something. But I've already mentioned that we need nearly 10 million new jobs just to get us back to where we were when the recession began. You can't get there creating just 100,000 or 150,000 jobs a month. You need 150,000 jobs a month just to keep up with increases in the working age population. In other words, just to tread water, you have to create 150,000 jobs a month. How in the world are we going to get to 10 million? One of the ways that I would address the jobs crisis is with a Rebuild America campaign a mammoth long-term effort to put people to work repairing, redesigning, and rebuilding the American infrastructure. This would create jobs and would address another crying need of ours. Much of our national infrastructure, our roads, bridges, schools, water and sewer systems, is in sorry shape and will have to be repaired or rebuilt in any event. When the bridge collapsed in Minneapolis, it ended up we had to repair it. When we had a catastrophe in New Orleans, it ended up that we had to drain New Orleans and rebuild the levees. We should have done it beforehand. Three quarters of the nation's public schools are outdated and inadequate. More than a quarter of our bridges are obsolete or structurally deficient. I recently went out to Minneapolis to interview a 32-year-old woman who went down in that terrible bridge collapse. She broke her back and shattered both of her legs. Thirteen people died, and it's a miracle more people weren't killed because it happened at rush hour. And we all know what happened in New Orleans, a great American city all but lost because we never invested in an adequate system of levees. So these are not boondoggles that I'm talking about. These are things that we really need to be taken care of. I know it's expensive, but this is money that would be an investment that would bring us real returns. Right now, it seems like the only thing we can build in this country are new sports stadiums. We can do better than that. If you go around New York, and New York is really weird in this respect, you have Shea Stadium, which actually was perfectly fine. I know people said they didn't like it, but you could play baseball there, no problem. <laughs> now you got City Field right next to it, two stadiums here in the Bronx. Two Yankee Stadium. Here's Yankee Stadium. There's Yankee Stadium. You know? I wonder, you, you could go in the wrong one. My Jets, they play with the Giants in the Meadowlands in New Jersey. They call it Giants Stadium. Right next to Giants Stadium is another Giants Stadium. I don't think they're going to call it Giants Stadium. The Jets will object. But it's a, it's a billion dollar stadium. They got two, sta two stadiums for every team. We can't build schools. It's a little weird. A rebuilt infrastructure would serve as the essential platform for an industrial and economic renaissance for the United States. Felix Rowan, the financier who helped save New York City from bankruptcy during the fiscal crisis of the 1970s, which really looks like small potatoes compared to what we're going through now, is working with members of Congress to try to get a national infrastructure bank created that would bring public and private capital together to finance these badly needed projects. A rebuilt infrastructure would be a boon to employment, and the societal benefits, if we did it right, would be incalculable. If we can find trillions of dollars to bail out banks and finance misbegotten wars, surely we can find the money to rebuild this aging edifice called America. Now, I'll explain to you the kind of weirdness that goes on in politics. I was privileged to be with a small group of columnists traveling on Air Force One with President Obama soon after he, he took office. And we're, we're around a big conference table on the plane, and you're asking questions, and I asked about infrastructure, because you got the whole jobs thing going on. And I asked him if he supported the infrastructure bank that I was just talking about, because you've got to raise this money. And he says, yes, he supports it. So I was really wondering, are we going to have a big legislative push from the Obama administration and get this infrastructure bank created and let's get going? No. He didn't say no, 
but that's what he said. What he told me was, well, you know, essentially, this is a very heavy lift politically. And we have trouble getting this kind of massive infrastructure, these massive infrastructure projects going, even if you could raise the money to fund them, because the local politicians have a claim on whatever is getting built in their areas. You know, this is the, this is the stuff, I guess, that they make their reputations on. Oh, I got the funding for this bridge. I got the federal government to finance this dam. I got the federal government to build this, I don't know, this school over there with my name. I see my name up there, you know. Um, and so you can't get any kind of rational approach to all the building that we need to do in this country. That's how you end up with things like the bridge to nowhere up in, up in Alaska. So you'll rebuild a bridge or build a new bridge where you don't really new, need one, while maybe in Minneapolis a, a bridge is falling in the drink because we don't have any coherent system for approaching this problem. This is crazy. This is, these, these are among the reasons why this nation is in so much trouble. Think about the benefits that derive from prior infrastructure investments the interstate highway system, the Panama Canal, rural electrification. If you're writing your own speech, don't put two words like rural electrification <laughs> in it where you have to say it out loud. The Transcontinental Railroad. Look at the internet. Nobody knew what was going to happen with the internet. You know, these are um, benefits that are never anticipated. I mean, I, I could do a whole different lecture on the benefits that came from our space program that we see and now take for granted in our ordinary lives and we don't even connect it with the space program. Uh, we used to have vision in this country. I don't know what happened to it. Where are our comparable 21st century efforts? China is building modern world-class airports all over the place. China and Europe have high-speed rail. We have cash for clunkers. That, that is sad. Let's put our people and our imaginations to work. I also think it's time for government to start putting more people to work directly while we commission a serious study to determine whether our economy is even capable of creating enough jobs for all who want and need to work. Because if we need 10 million jobs just to get back to December 2007, it may be that we don't have a way of getting there. If that's true, we need to have a national discussion about that. While that important question is being determined, we have an obligation to alleviate some of the suffering of those who have no hope of finding work soon. I think of the many people in our cities and rural areas who have long been idle and aren't even counted when the official unemployment statistics are compiled. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> The recession has absolutely crushed employment opportunities for unskilled, undereducated young people. Without direct government intervention, the recession is never going to end for them. The lessons of the Works Progress Administration and the Civilian Conservation Corps of the 1930s are there for us, ready to be studied, analyzed, updated, and applied to the present day needs of the country. Many of the jobs lost in this downturn are never coming back and some of those who were among the long-term unemployed even before the recession hit are unlikely to find any decent work for a long, long time. So focusing on job creation and rebuilding the infrastructure is the first prong of what I think of as a three-pronged regimen for bringing America back to health. The second prong is education. We have the world's best higher education system. We, here we are. <laughs> we, example number one. We used to lead the world in primary and secondary schooling as well, but no more. <clears throat> in their important book, The Race Between Education and Technology, the Harvard professors Claudia Golden and Lawrence F. Katz wrote, this is a quote, the slowdown in the educational attainment of young Americans at the end of the 20th century is especially striking when compared with the acceleration of schooling among many nations in Europe and parts of Asia where educational change has been exceedingly rapid. While other nations are gearing up on the education front, we foolishly let much of our public education system fall into sorry shape, and this problem has only gotten worse in the recession. Incredibly, 
Some 40,000 teachers have lost their jobs over the past year, according to the Center for Economic and Policy Research. How does that make any kind of sense in terms of the health of your society going forward when you're getting rid of 40,000 teachers over the course of a year? <clears throat> if we don't get our act together soon, if we don't rebuild our school buildings and restock our libraries and stem the scandalous high school dropout crisis, if we don't start providing a first-rate education for all of America's students, we can give up any idea of being the preeminent society of the 21st century. The 21st century will belong to the smartest, and right now, we are decidedly not the smartest. One of the key points Golden and Katz make in their book has to do with that period in the 20th century that I've been talking about when things were so, went so spectacularly well that it seemed almost magical. But of course, it wasn't magic. It was the result of the convergence of many fortuitous circumstances of which we were smart enough and bold enough to take advantage. They write, because the American people were the most educated in the world, they were the best position to invent, be entrepreneurial, and produce goods and services using advanced technologies, close quote. But since about 1980, we have inexplicably put the brakes on educating our citizens, and we are suffering as a result. Income inequality is off the charts. The American economy is a mess and we are receding in influence relative to other nations in the world. So our second prong in the three-pronged regimen for bringing America back to robust health should be an ironclad commitment to making our public school system once again the finest in the world. The kids, the kids who graduate from, from that system, if we can put together a really fantastic public education system, the kids who graduate will go on to college well qualified, and some of them, believe me, will set the world on fire. A well-educated citizenry is our only real hope for the future. Without that, we're lost. I'll leave you this afternoon with the third component of my prescription for America. We have to stop these foolish wars. No nation can flourish in a permanent state of warfare. That's madness. No nation can do that. <laughs> Youngsters who were 9 and 10 years old on September 11, 2001, are now being sent off to fight and sometimes die in the seemingly endless conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. To what end? What are our goals? What constitutes victory? And how much are we willing to expend in human treasure and money that we don't have? In an introduction to David Halberstam's book, The Best and the Brightest, John McCain wrote movingly about our involvement in Vietnam in words that are profoundly and eerily applicable to the wars we are fighting today. He said, War is far too horrible a thing to drag out unnecessarily. It is a shameful thing to ask men to suffer and die, to persevere through god-awful afflictions and heartaches, to endure the dehumanizing experiences that are unavoidable in combat for a cause that the country wouldn't support over time and that our leaders so strongly believed could be achieved at a smaller cost than our enemy was prepared to make us pay. No other national endeavor, he said, requires as much unshakable resolve as war. If the nation and the government lack that resolve, it is criminal to expect men in the field to carry it alone." Close quote. The only thing that needs to be updated about that is the fact that we now regularly send women as well as men off to war. Reality is beckoning to us and we can't afford to ignore it much longer. We will not be able to bring America back to robust health if we do not directly attack the awful scourge of unemployment, create a world-class public school system for all of our children, and end these debilitating wars. Thank you very much.